Stephen Smith or God. Tonight's speakers, Pastor James Burns, Jr. from the Memorial Presbyterian Church in Norman, Oklahoma, and Dr. Jamal Badawi, Professor, St. Mary's University, Halifax, Canada. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah, creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. And may his peace and blessings be upon his last messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and on all messengers which preceded him, peace be upon them. Respective guests, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and in humanity, I greet you all tonight with the greeting of Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and blessings of Allah be with you all. We, the Muslim Student Association, University of Oklahoma chapter, here in Norman, Oklahoma, welcome you all, each and every one of you tonight, to a Christian and Muslim dialogue. This dialogue will investigate the main difference between Islam and Christianity. That is the nature of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And the topic to be discussed is whether Jesus, peace be upon him, is Christ, man, myth or God. At this point in time, I wish to both introduce and welcome our two speakers tonight who will participate in this dialogue. Sitting on the left, we have Reverend uh, Burns, Jim Burns, who is a pastor at Memorial Church, uh, Memorial Presbyterian Church in Norman. He has been here now two years. He attended Texas A&M University, and he received his BS degree in physics in 1965. He went on and um, obtained his, uh, his MS in physics in 1967, in which he did research at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in atomic physics. And also he went on to his PhD in physics as well and finished it in 1970 and did research in nuclear physics at Texas A&M, Texas A&M's Cyclot Cyclotron Institute. Reverend Burns then taught physics and engineering for four years at A&M, Texas A&M, at Moody College in Galveston, Texas. He then attended Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminar Seminary from 1974 to 1977, in which he received a Master of Divinity from the school. He then left seminary and began work as Presbyterian minister in Lone Oak, Arkansas. So we welcome uh, Reverend Burns tonight for this dialogue. The second speaker who will participate in our dialogue is sitting on the right, and he is Dr. Jamal Badawi, who is a professor at St. Uh, Mary's University in Halifax, Canada. Before starting the dialogue, I wish to bring to your attention the following points. The order and the timing of each of the speakers has been mutually agreed upon before the event. Therefore, Dr. Jamal Bedoui will start the speech for 35 minutes, and then Dr. Uh, Reverend Jim Burns will also speak for 35 minutes after that. We will then have our question and answer session, and uh, in the end, each one will have an option of five minutes to, for closing comments if he wishes to do so. And before I finish, brothers and sisters in humanity and in Islam, I wish to say that I realize each one of you has set aside valuable time when he came or she came here tonight to listen to this dialogue. And uh, there are some of us who have come here from different states. They have traveled far away to come and listen. Therefore, I pray to God that you will all find what you have come looking for and that you leave this event learning more about the truth behind the topic being discussed, that is, is Jesus Christ man, myth, or God? And I'd like to welcome now the first speaker, Dr. Jamal Bedoui, who will speak for 35 minutes.
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله All grace is due to Allah, the creator, sustainer and cherisher of the universe May his peace and blessings be upon his last messenger Muhammad and upon all messengers before him from Noah to Abraham to Moses, Jesus and finally Muhammad Peace and blessings be upon them all I begin first by greeting you with the traditional Islamic greeting Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you I thank Allah for giving me the opportunity to be with you at a very short notice and I am thankful to um, Reverend Byrne for accepting the invitation also to participate in this dialogue and I'd like to acknowledge also uh, among those who are present a very prominent theologian uh, Dr. Floyd Clark with whom I had the pleasure of moderating uh, discussion between him and Ahmed Bidat in Britain and his friend also Reverend uh, Bates so welcome to them and welcome to you all and I appreciated the opportunity there is no religion in the world outside of Christianity itself which makes it an article of faith to believe in to love and honor and respect Jesus outside of Christianity except Islam no other religion including Judaism shares this with Christianity the teaching of the Quran with that respect is echoed by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him when in one of his sayings said Quote, I am the nearest, that is the nearest in love to Jesus, son of Mary, in this world and in the next. The prophets are brothers, son of one father. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. There has been no prophet between us. Not only was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who spoke with respect and love, about his predecessor Jesus peace be upon him but according to the Quran also it shows that Jesus peace be upon him spoke with the same respect and love to his successor Prophet Muhammad and actually he directed his followers to follow him should he come in their lifetime in one sense then we find that Islam and Christianity share a very important common link as I call it but paradoxically enough as the chairman indicated in the beginning why this is a very important beginning it is also the nature of Jesus that is the basic reason of difference and understanding in theology between Islam and Christianity but that leads us to inquire as to how could we possibly conduct a fruitful type of dialogue beyond exchanging pleasantries in order to facilitate presentation an outline has been passed on so make sure you get one from any of the ushers if you haven't got any but as you notice in the first section I suggested that there could be possibly a number of approaches towards the so-called comparative Christology between Islam and Christianity either we could examine the authority and authenticity of both scriptures based upon which the perception or interpretation of Jesus peace be upon him is based or to examine the historical developments of various uh, dogmas or doctrines both in Islam and Christianity in the hope of trying to discern something about exactly who Jesus was or thirdly to leave these two questions basically aside and take both the scriptures as they stand today the Quran and the Bible as they are and try to examine both scriptures with the view of leaving open the question that one community of believers or the other might have either misinterpreted its own scriptures or somebody else's scripture at least to open the door for a possibility of a more fresh look into both the Quran and the Bible I am going to begin even by opening the Quran itself for investigation 
It is well known that Muslims uphold that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a human being, nothing but a great messenger and prophet of God, that he never claimed divinity, nor was a person in a triune godhood. But the question sometimes is raised as to whether Muslims might have not really understood or interpreted the Qur'an accurately. In the second section, I try to summarize in point form with all documentation available in the outline, basically what the Qur'an says about Jesus, peace be upon him. First, that his mother Mary is immensely praised in the Qur'an. The Qur'an speaks about the virgin birth of Jesus and compare it with the creation of Adam from neither man or woman and compare it also with a lesser miracle of the birth of John the Baptist from an old father and a barren mother. The Quran called Jesus a word from God or Allah, a term which refers to other human beings as well, a spirit from Allah which is used in the Quran to refer to other humans. He is described in the Quran as one who is honored in this life and the hereafter, one who is among those who are closest to God, and that expression appears in the Qur'an with respect to angels and great prophets and pious people only. He is described as a pure child, the same description that was given in the Qur'an to John the Baptist, and the same that is consistent with Muslim beliefs that every child is born innocent and pure. The Qur'an says that he was strengthened with the Holy Spirit. He performed miracles according to the Qur'an by the power and permission of his Creator, by the power of Allah. That he taught what all other prophets before him taught, to worship Allah or God alone, not to associate others with him in his divine attributes. The Qur'an indicates that his mission was directed towards the Israelites that he was teaching basically what all other prophets taught, that the Qur'an does not only negate what our Christian brethren considers as heretical interpretation in early Christianity, but the Qur'an speaks as well also about Trinity as not the explanation of the nature of Jesus. The Qur'an indicates that he was rejected by the Israelites. There was a conspiracy to crucify him which failed but as the Qur'an says, it so appeared to them, there was some confusion, and they thought that it was Jesus who was crucified. And finally, that Jesus, peace be upon him, echoed what other, many other prophets in the Old Testament prophesied about the advent of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He repeated the same thing. This kind of profile, as was described by a Christian writer, Rizanin in an article published by the Muslim world that this is a very impressive profile of a man who acted as a prophet and messenger of God with this kind of honor that is bestowed on Jesus and his mother in the Quran. I think if we have opened the Quran for investigation it would only be fair and reasonable at least from my humble understanding as a Muslim as well as the understanding of many biblical scholars also throughout history to inquire as to whether there could be a possible interpretation or reinterpretation of the Bible as it stands today regardless of the issue of authenticity and authority that might in fact not be too far away from what the Quran says in a more clear term so I'm turning now to Romans 3 in the following page Jesus in the Bible the essence of the presentation of that section is summarized in the first two points. The Muslim upholds that even by investigating the Bible itself, we find that the Old Testament does not really provide any foundation for the concept of Trinity or the notion of God incarnate. Secondly, that even in the New Testament, there is no conclusive statements made by Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, during his ministry, which very clearly indicate that he claimed to be God or to be divine. However, it is not enough to make statements in, dogma in dogmatic manner like that, 
as the Quran teaches the followers, bring forth your evidence if you are truthful, at least the evidence that you see, at least for the purpose of discussion. From my limited, humble understanding of, Bible, of the Bible and Christian literature on that issue, it appears to me that at least five f basic foundations for the deity of Jesus can be discerned. One is what has been said about Jesus or written about him. Two, what is attributed to him as claiming for himself as divine. Three, his miracles. Four, the issue of the salvation through the bloodshed, the loving concern of God by sending Jesus or reconciling the world uh, to himself. And fifthly, the issue of personal experience uh, or mystery. Let me touch briefly on each. Some of them might take longer time than the other. But the first one would not take much time, really. In a very serious matter, as believing in the creator of heavens and earth and all of this universe, a serious matter like that, one cannot base simply on witness made by other people. If anyone comes to me and says so and so who lived in any particular point of time was God in flesh, that itself is not a sufficient ground for me to determine a belief that would ultimately determine my destiny. In fact, we know from history that a lot of people have been deified by their followers, Krishna, Buddha, many other kings and rulers throughout history. But the main question really that should be raised here, did any of those claim indeed to be God incarnate? So I think the second question perhaps seemed to be the central question that might open the floor for some uh, sort of discussion and exchange of opinion as uh, Reverend Burns perhaps might present the Christian viewpoint. Let's take this idea of what Jesus claimed for himself or believed to have claimed for himself. And let me divide it into two areas, the positive statements and the negative statements. By positive statements, I mean the issues that usually arise in the context of Muslim Christian dialogue or discussion to show that Jesus indeed claimed to be divine. I had a list of 15 common questions like this, and I just like to deal with them very briefly and quickly. First, it is said that Jesus said in John 14:6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father but by me. From a Muslim standpoint, he says yes in a special way, amen, there is no dispute in that. Every prophet in his time speaks for God. And there is only one true way leading to God, the, the truth revealed by God. All other ways are false. And as such, the prophet actually represents literally the way that God has revealed to mankind. In that sense, Moses was the way, the truth, and life in his time. So was Jesus, so was all great prophets. Two, that Jesus said, I and the Father are one, John 10:30. But again, did he mean oneness in essence or oneness in purpose and spiritual communion? The Bible itself answers in John 17:11 and verses 20 through 23, we find that Jesus also referred to his oneness with his disciples. If Jesus meant to be one, with God in essence, then all disciples also must be divine because he said there is oneness also between himself and the disciples. Obviously, the oneness here is in purpose. Three, that Jesus said in 14.9 in John that whoever has seen him, he has seen the Father. But again, we all know that the term see does not necessarily see with the naked eye, but see also means knowledge. Whoever knows me and follows me, he knows the Father and he follows the Father. And this is not uh, totally far-fetched, because we find that in the Bible itself, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 33, verse 20, it says clearly that nobody can see God and lives. In the New Testament, in John 1, 18, 5, 37, and 14, 7, it again clearly says that nobody ever saw God or heard his voice. So obviously Jesus will not say, I am God, so whoever has seen me, he has seen God because I am God. Fourth. It is attributed to Jesus in John 8:58 that he said before Abraham, I am. But first of all, if one wanted to be very literal, he didn't say before Adam. 
just before Abraham, if you really want to be literal. But this is not really what is meant. After all, the angels were before Abraham and before Adam even. That is not really a foundation for claiming of divinity, because everything did exist in the knowledge of God before anything came to being. The notion of the term used by Jesus, I am, that it was used by God in Exodus, that it says there is an analogy there. I think this question needs to be examined carefully, because if somebody asks me and he says, are you Jamal Badawi, and I say, yes, I am, it doesn't mean that I am claiming divinity, because God happened to use the term I am also in the book of Exodus. Five, it is said that Jesus accepted worship of others as we find in Mark 14.33. But we all know that worship also does not mean necessarily believing in somebody as God. People worship money, worship their jobs. Worship means intense love also. But we find even more clear evidence in Luke 5.16 that Jesus himself worshipped God and taught his followers to worship God. Obviously, he did not believe himself to be the object of worship. Six that Jesus was called Son of God. But according to the Bible, Adam also was called Son of God, Luke 3, 38. So was Abraham, Jeremiah 31, 9. So was Jacob, Exodus 4, 22. David, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Solomon, 1 Chronicles 22, 10. More than one prophet, in fact, were, co were called firstborn. Firstborn. And never to mean the first chronologically, but mean best. But best doesn't mean the only best, because Abraham, Jacob, and David, all of them were called firstborn of God in different places in the Bible. Some prophets even were called begotten, as we find uh, pertaining to David in the second Psalm of David in verse 7. Even the term only son has been used in the Bible not to be taken literally. In the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 2, the term only son is not used literally as it refers to Isaac while Ishmael was already there. It was used also in uh, Genesis 6, 2, Deuteronomy 14, 1, Hosea 1, 10. All of these are evidence from both the Old and New Testament. Seven, that Jesus called God Father or Abba. But he also said, my father and your father, as we find in John 12, 20, 17. Even in the book of Romans and in Galatians, in Romans 8, 15, in Galatians 4, 6, we find that other people also may call God Abba, a more intimate term. Eight, that he was called Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew in, is Mashiach, in Arabic is Messiah, which means anointed. The Bible shows that David also was Messiah. Psalm 2, uh, two. Cyrus uh, was also called the Messiah, Isaiah 45, 1. 9, that Jesus was called Savior. So was Jehu Ahaz in 2 Kings 13, 5. The term Messiah was used also in plural in the book of Abadiah, verse 21, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. 10, that he was called Lord. But any reader of the Old Testament realizes that Lord was not always meant to be the God or the one and only Lord. Lord is used also in a sense of rabbi, master, or teacher. Eleven, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But that is not a claim for divinity because the Bible in Mark 1.15 shows that John the Baptist also was filled with the Holy Spirit. So was St. Barnabas in Acts 11.24. 12. That he is attributed to have said that my words will not pass away, and that's a claim of divinity. But again, in John 14, 24, Jesus says that what he says is not his own word, but the Father who sent him, which means my word, my, the God's word, will not pass away. 13. That it is attributed to him as have said, all authority in heavens and earth has been given to me. If we were to take that literally, it means that the authority of the Father ceases to exist, that there is no position for the Holy Spirit, and as such, Trinity does not exist anymore, if all authority in heavens and earth has been given to the Son. Obviously, it doesn't mean that at all. And even when he says, given to me, that means someone greater than me gave it to me, or else, how could I get it without his permission? 
14, that he was called by Thomas, my Lord and my God, in John 20, verse 28. But again, we have to stop here and wonder whether Thomas really, after resurrection, according to the Bible, was expressing admiration and surprise by saying, my Lord Jesus and my God meant God but not Jesus. But even if this meant to apply to Jesus, it could also very easily mean you are God-like, a metaphorical expression. And that is not very uh, difficult to discern in view of the fact that Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, makes it clear that there is only one God and one Lord, that is Jesus Christ. So the distinction between God and Lord is made distinct. 15. The Jews tried to stone him for blasphemy, and if they understood him to say Son of God in that sense that was used in the Old Testament, why did they want to accuse him of blasphemy, as we find in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John? But we all realize that the Jews were trying to indict Jesus, you might say, by hook or by crook. He accused them of hypocrisy, he accused them of all kinds of things, and they had, the religious establishment had every reason to want to get rid of him. One of the Siaphas, the high priest, was quoted once as saying that it is more expedient for one man to die rather than the nation. On the other hand, the question is still open as to whether the Jews consider Jesus blaspheming for claiming to be the Messiah because he differed from the image of the Messiah that they thought of one who is going to lead them into victory. But what is more important in addressing this issue is the answer given by Jesus himself, peace be upon him, in John 10:34, when he said to his accusers, is it not written in your law that ye are gods? According to some scholars, they say that this perhaps is referring to the 89th Psalm of David, verse 6, when even human beings allegorically are called gods. Even in the book of Exodus, in chapter 7, verse 1, it says that God sent Moses as God to the Pharaoh. Nobody has ever interpreted that to mean that Moses was incarnation of God, but God-like or representative of God. This is the context in which Jesus spoke to people who knew their Old Testament. This is what I call the positive statements that are sometimes presented as presenting an evidence of Jesus' claim of divinity. Admittedly, there may be others, but these are the most common ones, as most of you might be able to judge. But what is sometimes not quoted, in which I believe that a seminar like that would be useful in exchanging information and opening our minds and hearts to each other's views, that there is much more conclusive and clear statements in the New Testament in which Jesus negated his divinity. I listed only ten of them, but there could be more. One, he indicated that he does nothing on his own authority. John 5.30, 14.31, and Matthew 20, verse 23. Two, he indicated that he did not speak on his own authority, but what the Father ordained him to say. John 14:10, also chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Three, which is a very conclusive statement. He indicated that the Father is greater than himself. John 14:28. Four, the Bible says in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, that Jesus was tempted by the Satan. But according to the book of James in the Bible, chapter 1, verse 13, God cannot be tempted. And it would be totally pointless for Satan to try to tempt the creator of heavens and earth or to offer him the kingdom that he himself owns and created and say, I'll give you that if you bow down to me. The one who is tempted is only and fully human being who resisted that temptation nobly as Jesus did. Five. Jesus denied the knowledge of the unseen, which is a paramount characteristic of the divine. We find that in Luke 13, 32, in Matthew 24, 36. Six, Jesus was subject to change. He was mutable. We find that in Luke 2, 21, and also in verse 52, and we all know that God is immutable. For example, when it says that Jesus increased in knowledge and wisdom. God does not increase in knowledge and wisdom. His knowledge and wisdom is eternal and perfect from the beginning. 
7. He did not accept to be called good when somebody says good master to him. And definitely he deferred to God as we find clearly in Mark chapter 10 verse 18. 8. Jesus himself prayed to God. Prayer is nothing but a petition from a helpless creature of God to the one who has the authority, to his creator and the creator of all. How could Jesus, if he were God, pray to himself? How could he pray even to the, sec to the first person in Trinity because the definition shows that they are all equal in power? We find that in Mark 14.32, in Luke 5.16. 9. Jesus referred to himself as a prophet. Luke 13.33 and 4. Other people also believed into him and referred to him as a prophet. Luke 7.16. 24.19, John 6.14, and 40, Hebrew 3.1. He was referred to as a servant of God. Act 3.13, 4.27, and 30, Matthew 12 and 18. Now, he also finally made a distinction between himself and the Father. We find that clearly in Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 to 10. And may I add one comment at this point of one Christian scholar, a well-known Francis Young, when he said that Jesus, if you look at the titles given to him, there is only one title that has been very common that Jesus constantly and consistently referred to himself by, and that is the Son of Man. From both the positive and negative evidence, we can conclude in an answer to the second question, did Jesus really claim to be divine? In my humble understanding, definitely not. That leads us to the third question on the last page. Some might say the birth of Jesus, his miracles, and his life is in itself a testimony that speaks louder than words. It shows that he was divine, even if he did not say that in so many words. But again, if we investigate the Bible itself, I'm not talking about other sources, we will find that no miracle attributed to Jesus was not attributed to someone else in the Old Testament. Even virgin birth has been attributed to Melchizedek. Not really virgin birth, but it says in Hebrew uh, chapter 7 verse 3 that Melchizedek was born without a father, without a mother. There is no beginning or end to his days. Obviously that has to be taken, not literally, literally but if we were really to say all right, there is no other, even the Bible shows that there is even a greater miracle than the creation of Jesus, peace be upon him. Furthermore, according to the Quran also, I just if I add that as a footnote in the midst of all these biblical references, addresses the question of the virgin birth of Jesus in a very beautiful and succinct verse in the Quran that says in the translation of meaning, indeed the similitude in G of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him, that God created Adam from dust, and he said to him, be, and he was. That shows that the wonderful forms of creation of the Almighty God is four. One is to create a human from both a man and woman's side, which is every one of us in this hall, you and me, I suppose. I didn't see any dissent from that. Secondly is to create someone from neither man's side or woman's side, that was Adam. And in that sense, Adam even would be a greater miracle in creation. Three, to create a human being from a man's side, but not a woman's side. That was Eve. There was one form of miraculous creation that was not achieved yet, and God wanted to complete all four. To create a human from a, a woman's side, but not from a man's side. And that was Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him. When we speak about feeding the multitudes or walking on water, healing the leper and blind, bringing the dead to life, casting the devils, arising from the death, and ascending even to heaven. We find that mentioned in many places in the Bible, and I have given the quotations all in the outline, especially in the second book of Kings, in the book of Ezekiel, and in other places. We come finally, or close to finally, I should say, to the fourth issue. That it is not important, really, whether Jesus claimed it or not, but it is mainly the notion of the love of God and his forgiving mercy by reconciling the world to himself by sending Jesus to die for us. But that again seems to be based on a number of assumptions which are from a Muslim understanding questionable. 
to assume first of all that all human beings were created perfect. The Muslim would say if they were perfect, if Adam was totally perfect, he would have not been capable of disobeying God and eating from the forbidden tree. God created the human from dust, which is a symbol of materialism, which means that a human being is temptable by his very nature. It assumes also the necessity of bloodshed for forgiveness. And nowhere in the Quran do we find any trace of this idea that God requires the bloodshed, especially of the innocent, in order to forgive. The Quran speaks about repentance, sincere repentance to God who knows our weakness and our intentions. And furthermore, it is impossible to think of Jesus as the sacrifice, the perfect and infinite sacrifice for all mankind unless we assume that he was both man and God at the same time. But if we were to have that assumption, it would raise the question as to who died on the cross. According to Judaism, Christianity and Islam, to say that God died is a blasphemy against God. So the normal argument is that the one who died on the cross was Jesus the human, not the divine. But if only Jesus the human died on the cross, it is neither the infinite or perfect sacrifice for the birth of one man cannot take away the sins of all humanity. That leaves us in a very difficult situation if we were still to insist that Jesus was both man and God simultaneously. But aside from this issue, the notion of the dual nature of Jesus, the dual parenthood of Jesus, parentage of being the son of David and son of God at the same time, is difficult to reconcile. Indeed, we find many biblical scholars who are practicing Christians, some of whom have been clergy, in fact, people who are sympathetic to Christianity rather than atheists or critics of it, have indicated quite clearly that the, this notion of reconciling humanity to divinity is not really the original teaching of Jesus. Let me give you a couple of examples very quickly, as I have only about four minutes left. In the volume edited by John Hick called The Myth of God Incarnate, we find that in the introduction it shows clearly that the idea of God incarnate has developed later on as, quote, a mythological or poetic way of expressing the significance of Jesus to us, he says to us as Christians. Professor Maurice Wiles also indicates quite clearly that the writers of the New Testament were not only reporters, but they were interpreters of Jesus, and they gave him all kinds of titles, a prophet, son of man, Messiah, the A.D. Incarnation or Incarnation of Wisdom, an Old Testament concept. However, he says the first three Synoptic Gospels stopped short of what developed later on, the full-fledged deification of Jesus that was left to John. He says we can look at the idea of uh, reincarnation of Jesus as an interpretation which was only appropriate in the age which it arose than to treat it as an unalterable truth binding upon all subsequent generations. I could go on and on and on. I have plenty of this, but of course the time is closing. All I am saying that it is not only uh, an opinion of a Muslim brethren who is saying that there is no foundation, that these are reconcilable. Biblical scholars throughout history have uh, objected and raised this whole issue about the dual nature of Jesus that it is simply an impossible proposition to deal with. So let me come briefly in the remaining two minutes to the very last question. That some people say it doesn't matter what proof might be found or not found in the Bible. The proof in, of the pudding is in the eating. But if we were to take experience alone as the foundation, then we find people who are following many religions, many cults even, who can say the same thing. I feel great, I feel in peace by following this ideology. That does not determine ultimate truth. On the other hand, to say that this is a myth, I think, or a mystery, uh, seem to really avoid the issue that really needs to be discussed. There is a difference between saying that God is a myth, is a, sorry, God is a mystery, and that our human mind is incapable of fully comprehending God. I accept that as a Muslim, just as my Christian brethren also would state it. Yes, God is a mystery. We can't fully comprehend Him. But we can perceive of Him all the time. We can see the signs of His creation and existence in everything around us. So it is not contra-reason, it is not supra-rational to think of God in that term, even though I cannot perceive of Him. But to speak about concepts like Trinity or dual nature of Jesus that he never claimed as a mystery, 
That is a different issue. It is not a mystery. It is an intellectualized concept that some people created and tried to explain, articulate, and argue about it in uh, Christian council after Christian council, and for 2,000 years it is still subject to argument. It is an intellectualized item, not a mystery. It is human being who uh, proposed that to us, and again to refer to John Hick and his colleagues, actually if you examine carefully the Bible itself, you find that there is latitude and there is a great deal of room to reinterpret the Bible afresh, even from the standpoint of many practicing and learned Christians. Maybe that might close the gap that has existed for 1400 years between Muslims and their Christian brethren. Thank you very much for your patience and may peace and blessing be with you all. We thank Dr. Jamal Badoui very much for his topic. And we'd like now to invite Reverend Burns to shed light on this topic as well. In the 26th chapter of Acts, we read about uh, a man named Paul. Paul was standing before some rulers. One of the names, one of the rulers was named Festus. Paul says in verse 22, I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to the people and to the Gentiles. And as Paul thus made his defense, Festus spoke with a loud voice, Paul, you are mad. Your great learning is turning you mad. But Paul said, I am not mad, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking the sober truth. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak freely. And at that point he's speaking of a king named Agrippa, who is also present. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time you think to make me a Christian? I want to repeat that. In a short time, you think to make me a Christian. And Paul said, well, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul was, of course, at that time a prisoner. When I was asked a couple of weeks ago to have to enter into this dialogue, I thought about it and I thought it's really sort of a crazy thing in a way. How can I stand up here in a short time? Uh, how can uh, Dr. Bittowee, right, got it right. Bittowee stand up here in a short time and explicate the belief on this very significant subject? Uh, in a short time, it's difficult to have such a dialogue. Thinking of the things that were being said, I would like to reply to them one by one. But we don't have that time, so we make the best of it. In a short time, I would like to say some things. I would like to begin to speak about this belief and say what I understand it to mean uh, from the Christian point of view. Between any two religions, there are significant similarities. There are also notable differences. I read a passage from a book entitled The Spirit of Islam. In this book, Allah is described in these words, the holy, the peaceful, the faithful, the guardian over his servants, the shelterer of the orphan, the guide of the erring, the deliverer from every affliction, the friend of the bereaved, the consoler of the afflicted. In his hand is good, and he is the generous Lord, the gracious, the hearer, the near at hand, the compassionate, the merciful, the very forgiving, whose love for man is more tender than the mother bird for her young. I thought of those words again, holy, peaceful, faithful, guardian, shelterer, guide, deliverer, friend, compassionate, and so on. Those were words that it seems to me I could agree with. It is evident, therefore, that Islam and Christianity share common views about the nature of God. But of course there are differences. And in seeking a unity of understanding, we should not overlook the differences. 
In exploring differences, we should not overlook what we agree on, though. And only as we talk together with open minds, even though we have but a short time, can we hope to at least to begin or continue in trying to understand each other's beliefs. Jesus was man, myth, or God. If you gave me a true-false test, you forced me to say yes or no, true or false, here's what I would say if you forced me. Jesus was a man, true. Jesus was a myth, false. Jesus is God, true. But I would want to say a little bit more about those, and especially about the statement about Jesus being a myth and Jesus being God. First off, look at Jesus being a myth. I don't believe Jesus was a myth, but I do believe that there are myths about Jesus. I do believe there are myths about Jesus outside the Christian community, and I do believe that there are myths about Jesus within the Christian community. Even in the early church, there were myths. There are 27 books in the New Testament. There are four books that are called the Gospels. Most people don't know that there was in the early church a Gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. But it was rejected. It was a Gospel that purported to say some things about Jesus that people just did not accept. It told stories about Jesus as a youth. It told how one day he took some mud and he took that mud and he molded it into 12 little sparrows and he clapped his hands and the sparrows flew about and they flew away. And it tells many, many stories. People thought, that's not Jesus. They're, I won't go into their reasoning. That was what people thought to be a mythical story about Jesus. But even in this day and time, there are myths about Jesus. Some people would say, well, if Jesus is God, then he could have just been there in his cradle as a one-day-old baby, thinking about the universe, doing higher mathematics in his mind if he so, choose, so chose, you know, thinking the things of God. You know, I think that that is a myth. I think that the nature of Jesus was such that if he was God, he was not God in that sense. But that's not what it meant to say he was God. There are other myths. And I won't go into them. One of the myths in this country is we take in this country and we shape Jesus so he looks more and more like an American. And the values that uh, America deems good, somehow it seems that we hear more and more scriptures about the values that agree with that. Uh, we should be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, I think Jesus wants us to be wise. But I'm not certain that Jesus promised that if we followed his way, we would always be physically healthy and literally wealthy, at least in terms of money, finances. So there are myths. The problem that Christians and non-Christians have is how to separate the myth from the real Jesus. If a person says that Jesus is God, how do we make, know that that person is making a true statement? How do we know that that person is not propagating a myth? And if Jesus is God, what is meant by that? If I say Jesus is God, someone might say, so what? What does it mean to the way that I live my life this day and the day that comes tomorrow? How do we come to see the real Jesus, the non-mythical Jesus? How do we come to understand who Jesus really is? My claim is, is that there are three sources. I've understood that Christians have claimed that there are three sources. The primary source, it seems to me, are the scriptures. The scriptures of the Old and New Testament, the Bible. The second source is the community of believers. In the first letter that John wrote in the New Testament, John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. The community, the early community saw something, heard something, touched something, and passed it on to the next generation, it was passed on to the next generation, the next generation. 
to the generation that lives in 1986, the community has said things about Jesus. And that influences what the people in today's community believe. The third source, first, first there is the scriptures. Secondly, the community of believers. And thirdly, there is what I would call personal encounter. This is very difficult, I think, for Christians to explain. Christians talk about having a relationship with Jesus. Christians talk about Jesus as if he were, as if he is a being that exists today, is alive today. Some people paint this in mystical terms. Others speak of it in non-mystical terms. They speak of personal encounter with Jesus as they meet brothers and sisters, as they meet neighbors, whether they are Christian neighbors or not. They say, they say that they encounter Christ in other people. And somehow that, that, that encounter, again, shapes the understanding of who Jesus is. Three sources, the scriptures, the community of Christian believers, and personal encounter with Christ himself in the here and now, in this day. Let's look first at the scriptures. What do I see in the scriptures that would lead me to believe that Jesus is God? A beginning point for me, and every Christian would probably begin in a different place, but for me, I keep going again and again to the very first chapter of the Gospel according to John. In John chapter 1, John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word is equated to God. And then later in the first chapter, John writes, And the Word became flesh. The Word who is equated to God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Notice it does not say the word put on flesh as a youngster would put on a Halloween costume. The word became flesh. The incredible claim seems to be that God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, became flesh and dwelt among people. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 to 17, Jesus says to his disciples, But who do you say that I am? He had asked them earlier who other folks said he was, who other folks were saying he was. And he says, But who do you, you who have walked with me, say that I am? And Simon Peter, who was always outspoken, replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, the Son of the living God. Now, does Jesus agree with this assessment or does he disagree? Notice what he answers. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, what you have said, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus seems to have accepted that assessment. Now, does being the Son of God mean that Jesus is God, I turn to John chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Jesus is explaining to some people why he heals people on the Sabbath. And he says, my father is working still, and I am working. My father doesn't take a day off when it comes to dealing with human herd, and neither do I. Now note what response is made to this statement. We read that for this reason, for what he said, his enemies, quote, sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Making himself equal with God, end quote. The enemies of Jesus believed that Jesus was claiming to be equal with God by calling God his Father, and Jesus did not deny that. In John chapter 10, verse 31, we run into a similar occurrence. His enemies took up stones to stone Jesus. And Jesus said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works, these good works, do you stone me? His enemies answered him, It is not for a good work that we stone you, but we stone you for blasphemy. Because you, 
being a man. Make yourself God. End quote. You being a man, make yourself God. Jesus, in relating himself to the Father, was seen by others as claiming to make himself equal to God. Jesus, in accepting Peter's claim to be the Son of the living God, was to others making himself equal to God. In John chapter 20, we read about the encounter of Jesus with his disciple Thomas. It is a Sunday, one week after the resurrection. Thomas, who has not seen yet the risen Christ, is with the other disciples in a room when Jesus appears. And Jesus invites Thomas to feel his wounds. And Thomas at that point cries out these words, My Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. In the book of Acts, we have the story of a man who meets Peter. The man whose name is Cornelius met Peter and he fell down at Peter's feet and he worshipped Peter. But Peter lifted him up and said, stand up, I too am a man. Jesus, however, seemed to accept these words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. He did not say, don't say that to me, I am simply a man. Now here are some of the claims of Jesus. Notice these claims are not claims in which he is saying, I am God. There are other claims, but I want to say something about the claims. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says in chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die. In John chapter 14, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He says in chapter 14, verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the eternal Father. In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, I'll read portions of these, this passage. Again, I'm wanting to put forth some claims that are being apparently being made by Jesus. Jesus was preaching the word. It says to those gathered about him, some people came bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four men. When they could not get near Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus said, saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. Say you have done great harm against another person. Maybe that other person has the right to forgive you, but what right would I, a mere man, have to come up and say, it's okay, your sins are forgiven. And the people who heard him knew exactly what the problem was. Listen to what they said. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak thus? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God has the right to forgive sins. And Jesus didn't say, oops, you, you misunderstood me. You misunderstood me. He let it lie just as he had spoken. it. He says in John chapter 10, verse 30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Read the very next line. His enemies took up stones to stone him. Why? For blasphemy, claiming to be one with the Father, making himself God. These claims that I read, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, notice they are very egocentric. I am this, I am that, I will do this, I will do that. Would one who was simply a man gain our admiration in making such claims? scholar has said that on hearing such claims we must simply say one of three things Jesus was lying or he was crazy or he was who he 
was apparently claiming to be God incarnate. If Jesus did say the things I have read, I believe that we are forced into making some difficult choices. The second source which helps us to see the real Jesus is the community of believers. First source is the scripture. But I, I contend we don't stop there. The scriptures are always read through the community. We run into the first Christian community in the scriptures themselves. Paul, writing to Christians in the city of Colossae, says these words. In Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him and in him all things hold together. I remember as a scientist pondering on that, thinking as deeply as I could, which sometimes wasn't wasn't too deep about the atomic and nuclear forces. And I ran across this passage as I began to under, uh, read the Bible. And I read, in him all things hold together. You know, all things hold together. Even maybe the very central forces of the universe, atomic and nuclear forces, all things hold together in him. Of course, Paul was probably talking about not, not things like that, but all things meaning all things that have to do with people and what people believe and love that should exist between people all fly apart outside of him. And then Paul writes to these Christians, In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The first Christian community saw, began, the first Christian community, though they could not verbalize it as well as they might want to, claimed that Jesus was not simply a man, but that he was in some way God made flesh. Three hundred years later, the Nicene Creed was formulated, again by another community of Christian believers in the year 381. And in that creed, the community says, We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, God of God, being of one substance with the Father, very God of very God. The community continues to believe that somehow in Jesus there is more than man, there is God himself. 1,300 years later, the Westminster Confession of Faith is formulated. One of the statements in that, in that document refers to Jesus as, quote, eternal God. And only 19 years ago, a confession of faith was written by Presbyterian Christians in which Jesus Christ is said to be. Let me say the whole phrase. Jesus Christ is God with us. Again, that claim of Christ, Jesus being God with us. God with us today. Not only God with the world in the flesh back then. And then the third source I would refer to which helps people to see who Jesus is is what I would call the source of personal encounter. There are... there. There is the Bible, the scriptures of Old and New Testament. There is the community of believers, and there is personal encounter. Christians have claimed that Jesus still lives, that he's not simply a person in a book, such as was Abraham Lincoln, or Winston Churchill, or someone who lived long ago. Christians have claimed that the risen Jesus is still present in this world. As I said, some people see this in a mystical way. In fact, Paul writes to these same Christians in Colossae that I referred to earlier. He writes about a mystery which has been shown to God's people, and he defines that mystery as Christ in you. So Christians have seen that somehow Christ is in us. For some, that's defined in a mystical way, and some people see it in a non-mystical way, encountering Christ through our neighbors. Jesus said, when you saw someone hungry and gave food to them, you were doing that to me. When you saw someone who was naked and you gave clothes to them, that was me. When you visited someone in prison, you were visiting me. So some people see the encounter with Christ in a more non-mystical way. 
But Christians have claimed there is an encounter. And the circumstances of our lives in which we meet Christ, I claim, help to shape our understanding of who Christ is. Just as meeting Christ when he walked on the earth and the flesh shaped the understanding of the first followers of Christ. And through these encounters with Christ, people have come to say, we have sensed that we are meeting God himself. In the last analysis, and this again relates to the claim that, to the statement that Festus made. In a short time, you expect to make me a Christian, Paul. Your great learning has made you mad. And my great learning has made me mad if I think that two world religions can stand up here and end the evening by saying, oh, there is unity, we understand each side, the mistakes we made, and we shake hands and leave, and we announce tomorrow in the paper that the Muslim Christianity problem has been solved. In the last analysis, whether you spend 40 minutes or 40 days or 40 years, Christians cannot prove that Jesus is God, but they do claim it, and I submit that they, have, that they believe they have reason to claim it, to me, though, if the claim is true, so what? What does it mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus is God? Well, of course, it means that he is more than a man. It means, in fact, that he is more than a special man, a superman, simply a wonder worker. It means, in fact, that God has walked the earth with his people. It means that God, through Christ, has literally felt the frustrations, the temptations to sin, the sorrows that you and I have felt. And this would not be the case if God, Jesus was simply God. I submit that even God cannot understand how I feel unless he has in some measure walked in my shoes. That's one of the frustrations I feel. I cannot really grasp the belief of the Muslim community without somehow walking in your shoes, and I don't know yet how to do that. If Jesus is both God and man, then God has experienced what it means to be man. The Word has become flesh, and the Word understands what it means to be flesh. And it also means if God and Jesus are one, it also means that God has in a way that I can't fully explain that, and that does become, come very close to blasphemy. It means that God did die for us. Okay. If there is such a thing as consequence for sin, then such a thing as consequence for sin, then God through Jesus has borne that consequence in a way that would have literally destroyed a man. It's like a debt that we cannot pay. One who is wealthy pays the debt. The son is given up, but then we find surprise. The giver himself has become the son, and it's all done at great, great cost. The early church argued this back and forth. And some people say, well, does this mean that God the Father himself died on the cross? And people say, that's heresy. That's patripassionism, I think was the phrase that they used. But then Christians did begin to say, but God in the presence of the Son did die on the cross. People ended up saying, no, it wasn't just simply the man part of Jesus. It was Jesus, the God-man, who died on the cross. If Jesus is God, it means that we somehow... That, that we see in Jesus, God himself modeling, living out the life that God wants us to live. Nobody likes someone from on high saying, do this. God is saying through Christ, then don't follow words from on high, but do as I do, live as I live. And it means that in Christ, we ultimately see what God is like. Sometimes we say God is like this, God is like that, and I say, how do you know? God is not like a bunch of words we want to string together. 
I claim God is like a person that walked on this earth who said, love your neighbor as I have loved you. Mean that you would be willing to go to the cross for your neighbor. If someone hits you on the cheek, turn the other cheek and let him hit the other cheek. If an occupation troop, if an occupation soldier says, carry my pack a mile, carry it willingly a second mile. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Now, do Christians live that way? No. But Christians underneath know that that's how God wants them to live. I believe that Jesus is God. What do you know for certain? Someone might ask. I looked in the dictionary, the Random House College Dictionary this past week, and know is defined in this way. Know means to perceive or understand clearly and with certainty. And I certainly do not understand clearly and with certainty who Jesus Christ is. I flipped back in the dictionary to see what the word believe meant. And believe means to have confidence in the truth or reliability of something without absolute proof. Without absolute proof. And I do have confidence in the reliability of certain statements concerning Jesus Christ. Although I do not have absolute proof that those statements are true. And I have confidence in those statements, ultimately because I have confidence in the scriptures and the Christian community and in, that, and in the personal encounter that I have experienced with this living Christ. Why do I have confidence in those sources? Two answers I would give. The first answer is this, as I interact with these sources, I hear the ring of truth. As I read the Bible, as I listen to the community of believers in Christ, as I think about my own encounter with Christ, I hear the ring of truth. There is a non-biblical proverb or saying, and it goes like this. Things are to be used. People are to be loved. Now, I can't prove that's true, but that statement has the ring of truth. I do not believe that people are to be used and things are to be loved. I believe just the opposite. And what I run into in the sources that I've spoken of have the ring of truth to me. Secondly, as I have followed the leading of these sources, their leading has taken me into ways, into paths that work for me. In a sense, what these sources say to me is like a theory. Please don't misunderstand the word theory. When I look at the sun and I say the sun gives warmth, that is a theory. You say, oh, that's a fact. You know, maybe it's a fact, but a fact means it can be proven with no error possible. Theory is something that there can be good theories and bad theories. In a sense, what these sources say is a theory that explains and orders life in a way that makes sense to me and in a way that works for me. In the world of science, new theories are, re are reshaped theories pop up on the horizon. But the best scientists are reluctant to discard the old theories because they have worked, because they have stood the test of time. And even when the new theories take over, it is often the case that they include the old theories as a part of the truth, as a special case. And I am not saying that I believe that Christianity is simply a theory that may one day pass away. I am saying two things, though. I am saying that I am open to what God may say to his world tomorrow. I am open, I hope, to what I might hear this evening and have heard this evening. I am willing to listen to other views. Truth is God's truth. Truth is God's truth, and I do not want to miss the truth. But then I am reluctant to dis discard what has seemed truth to me, what makes sense to me, what brings meaning into my life, what has empowered the working out of my life. And so, for me, it boils down to an encounter through the scriptures, through the community, through the living Christ, in which my life was changed at a point in time and in which my life is still being changed and enriched. I remember, I remember 20 years ago, 1966, 
my first year in graduate school, being deeply affected by an idea that though I had grown up in Christian America, I just didn't ever understand, being deeply affected by the idea that God himself actually walked on this earth. I remember being deeply affected by the idea that God himself wanted to be a part of my personal everyday life to live in me, to live in me in some sense. I remember being deeply affected by the idea that God in Christ died for my sins. My notion had been that somehow I had to do more good than bad in order to win God's approval. The scales had to be weighed and the good had to outweigh the bad. I felt I was fighting a losing battle. I felt that the death, so to speak, was piling up against me. And then I was confronted with the idea that Christ died for me so that the debt could be abolished and that Christ would empower me throughout my life to make me into a person who could eventually offer to God's kingdom more, God, more good than bad. In Jesus, I do not see a God who loves us because we are good. In Jesus, I see a God who dies to begin a process that will enable us to become all that God intends for us to be. A God who dies, a God who lives today to make us what God wants. I close with words of a Christian professor, William Spurrier. Is Christ the God-man, he asks. In the last analysis, it can only be answered from inside the Christian faith. The problem cannot be settled from outside. So the real answer to the question is this. If we are not in Christianity, the honest answer would, be, would seem to be the agnostic one of I don't know, I don't know. But if we are inside the Christian faith, Dr. Spurrier continues, the answer throughout Christian history is that Christ... Thank you. for his talk tonight. What I'll do now is I'll address the question once to Dr. Jamal Bedoui and once to Reverend Burns, and each one will try to his best to be concise in his answer so that we can get as many questions answered. To start off with Jamal Bedoui, the first question is, do Muslims believe in the second coming of Jesus? If yes, then why was he the only prophet to come again? Yes, Muslims believe in the second coming of Jesus. While this is not directly referred to in the Quran, it is referred to in no less than 70 sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In completing the answer to that question, I'd like to connect the second part. Why was Jesus the only one, not even Muhammad or Abraham, coming again? The answer to me is very simple. Was there any confusion about the humanity and full humanity and nothing but of any other prophet? Was there any problem after Prophet Abraham, people interpreting him as God or God man? That confusion did not arise after Moses or Muhammad. Yes, there is good reason for Jesus to come to declare the truth about himself. And that leads me to complete the answer that in the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he says that one of the main functions when Jesus comes is to declare the truth about himself. Actually, in some hadith, it speaks clearly about rebuking those who defied him without any evidence on the basis of just sheer speculation. And that in one saying of the Prophet, he says the first thing he will do is to break the cross and kill the pig. Breaking the cross as a symbol of deviation from the consistent Old Testament uh, teaching of the oneness of God, which was confirmed after him by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And killing the pig is a symbol also of that he never meant that the law is abolished through his coming as Paul interpreted. Yes, we believe in his second coming as a follower of the generic Islam, which was the religion, teaching, and faith of all prophets throughout history. The Reverend Burns, this person asks two questions. First of all, he says, just give me three simple reasons why did you say Jesus is God? And the second question is, as everyone knows, 
Jesus is human, same with us. If you say Jesus is God, so God is also human. Human, as you know, are not always perfect in everything. So why did we have to believe in a God like that? Uh, again, again I, I would like to emphasize there are certain things that people may claim to know and certain things people may claim to believe. I do not come here this evening claiming that I can prove to you that Jesus is God. I believe that he was God because of my understanding of the, of, the, of the scriptures, the ones that I read this evening, I believe that Jesus was claiming to be God. The second reason is, is I believe that his uh, enemies were thinking that he was making that claim. Now, if my enemy believes me to be something, uh, that certainly doesn't mean that I am that something. But it at least means that the enemies thought that that was the issue. And Jesus never, in my understanding, did anything to disagree with the judgment of his enemies. And then the third reason is, uh, again, as Christians have thought about this over many, many centuries, they have concluded that. And uh, someone might say, well, do you take it simply on the authority of others? I find that I'm always faced with taking things on the authority of other people or on my own authority. And if I hear many other people saying things and I hear only one voice in myself, then I want to think seriously about what the other people are saying. And Christians throughout the centuries have claimed that Jesus is God. And that, through all the sources, the personal encounter, the scriptures, makes sense to me. The second question was, as everyone knows, Jesus is human. I agree. Jesus was human. Yeah. Now, and then, and then he says, if you say Jesus is God, so God is also human. Human, as you know, are not always perfect in anything. So why do we have to believe in a God like that? Christians have tried to explain in ways that Christians today still struggle with. Jesus being the God-man. And they've tried to figure out how do you divide that up. And, and Christians have ended up that they don't. Uh, God became human, became flesh, in the sense that I might become another person, but I still am myself. In becoming another person, though, I am, I am, ex am not that other person necessarily, but I'm experiencing what it means to be that other person, or experiencing what it's like to be that other person. That Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jamal Badoui, you said that the advent of Prophet Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible. Do you have any evidence to back up this statement? The Bible is full of evidence, but our Christian brethren perhaps might have not been aware of that, and this is one virtue of those seminars. In the book of Genesis, we are told quite clearly that God promised to bless the nations of earth through the descendants of Abraham. We all know historically that all Israelite prophets came through his second son, Isaac. And we know historically that through his first son, Ishmael, Prophet Muhammad also was born. That itself is sufficient. However, there is confirmation of that also. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 11, when it speaks about someone great to come from the stem of Jesse, J-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, which has been sometimes mistakenly interpreted to mean the father of David. In fact, according to Encyclopedia Biblica under names, it says Jesse is an abbreviation of Ishmael because Ishmael in Hebrew is Yishmael, abbreviated Yeshi Jesse. Secondly, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, verse 18, it is stated clearly, Moses addressing the Israelites in his presence, say that God will raise you from among your brethren a prophet like unto me. Now, how could that be applied as some New Testament writers interpreted to apply to Jesus? Jesus is not of the brethren of the Israelites. He is himself an Israelite. Number two, he is believed to be the son of God or God-man. And Moses was not God-man. How could we make comparison? The prophet like unto Moses, who lived like Moses, had a normal birth and death and had children and encountered his enemies and had both moral and physical victory are definitely comparison between Muhammad and Moses. Peace be upon them both. In the same book of Deuteronomy in chapter 33 and the first two verses, 
we find that it speaks about Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad at the same time. It says God came from Sinai, the, the Torah received by Moses, shined or rose up unto them from the hills of Seir. Seir is part of Palestine, that is where Jesus himself preached. And it says he will shine forth from Mount Paran. According to the Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 21, verse 21, Paran is the place where Abraham took his son Ishmael and his mother Hagar, i.e. Mecca as it's well known historically, and the monuments are still there, the Kaaba and the Well of Zamzam since the days of Ishmael. The three are mentioned in the same, and notice the pro progression of revelation. God came, rose, shined forth, which means the final revelation to reveal the entire truth that all of these great prophets carried throughout history. You go to the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and you find a clear profile of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in no unmistakable terms. While the chapter speaks about the elect of God, the select of God, the servant of God, and praises him, and speaks about the farthest isles waiting for his law, it says, let the villages that Kedar inhabits feel happy and joyful. And according to the Bible in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 13, Kedar is the name of the second son of Ishmael, i.e. it refers to the advent of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca. In the same book of Isaiah in chapter 21, especially verses 13 through 17, we find a very prolific description of the migration of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. It speaks about the people of Timan, and according to John McKenzie's dictionary of the Bible, Timan is an oasis north of what is now Medina. So you talk about the vicinity from which to which the Prophet migrated. It speaks about the people of Timan bringing water he, to him that was thirsty, defending with their bread him that fled. It speaks about those who fled to them because of persecution. Definitely a reference to the coming of Prophet Muhammad and his companions. But more importantly, it speaks also about Kedar in the same chapter. That the number of the mighty men of Kedar will be diminished. And that's exactly what happened because one year after the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the pagans from Kedar, from his own clan, came to destroy him and they failed. If you move very quickly and leave so many other signs to the New Testament, in the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 25, when John the Baptist came, the Jews sent his, their scholars to ask him, Are you Elijah, the second coming of Elias? He said, No. They said, Are you Christ? He said, No. Then they asked a third and distinct question, Are you that prophet? Which they meant another one other than the second coming of Elias, other than the coming of Christ. Who could be that prophet except the one from the brethren of the Israelites, i.e. from the Ishmaelite descent? i.e. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There is more that can be said about the concept of Paraclete, but perhaps I stop at that in consideration of the time. Second question now to um, Reverend Burns. Does Jesus need the help of his father, or can they work independently? I think that... Um, First off, the answer and then an explanation. I believe that Jesus always works in relationship to the Father. I believe that excuse me. I believe that Jesus always works in the relationship to the Father. Jesus speaks, I and the Father and the Father are one. Jesus says, I say nothing on my own authority. I listen to the Father and I do what He says. And uh, I know that one of the responses to that is, well, and that shows that Jesus is subordinate uh, to God. That shows that Jesus stands in a relationship to God the Father. Uh, that does not mean that, that, that that reduces the claim of Jesus being God. I think that Jesus, as He lived on this earth, lived in such a way whereby he was dependent upon his father. I don't know if I understand completely what the incarnation, I know I don't know completely what the incarnation means, but I said earlier that when Jesus was born as a baby, that I don't believe that he lay around in his cradle thinking how neat it is to be God. It seems that maybe in being born on this earth, 
that it was as if God entering this earth in the form of Jesus was giving up while on earth some of what it would ordinarily mean to be God. So that Jesus grew up dependent not only on his heavenly father, but dependent upon uh, the brothers and sisters, his parents that were on the earth. And so there is a dependence upon uh, humankind and ultimately a dependence upon his father. I think that the life that Jesus led live was a model of how we are supposed to approach the father just as jesus could do nothing without the power of the father we can do nothing without the power of the father yes jesus is always related dependent upon the father doctor doctor jamal badawi does the Quran accept the Bible? If yes, why not? Does the Quran? Does the Quran accept the Bible? If yes, why not accept Jesus as divine? Two pronged answers. The first one, the word Bible does not appear anywhere in the Quran. I think that might sound surprising to some. We know that the Bible is a book of books. 63, 66 in the Protestant version, 73 in the Catholic version, each one of them, of course, believe that this is the complete and, uh, and full word of God. We know that the, old, the Bible is divided into Old Testament and New Testament. In the, New, in the Old Testament, the first five books, the Pentateuch, are believed to be the Torah. The Quran used the term Torah if it refers to something or part of the Old Testament. But even the terminology used in the Qur'an to refer to the Torah does not mean the first five books. Because the Qur'an speaks about what Moses received. Whereas we find that in the, the Torah, as defined by our Jewish and, and Christian brethren, it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34 towards the end, Moses, the man of God, died and was buried. Obviously that was not received on Mount Sinai. That's why some biblical scholars believe that this was written by someone else other than Moses, probably Joshua. The Quran does not speak about that, speak about the direct revelation to Moses. Secondly, the Quran doesn't speak anywhere about the New Testament, because we all know the New Testament is the four Gospels and the other 23 books, which are written by people who, as you know, some of them, as uh, uh, Reverend um, uh, Burns knows, uh, were not eyewitnesses. Half of the New Testament, 13 books are attributed to Paul, at least, maybe 14, they differ on the 14th, uh, who was not an eyewitness of Jesus, peace be upon him. Jesus definitely was not teaching from the Gospels written after him by the four Gospel writers. When the Quran speaks about the Gospel or Injil giving to Jesus, it doesn't talk about the four Gospels. And when in the New Testament itself we find references that Jesus went around teaching the Gospel, he wasn't carrying John, Luke, Matthew and, uh, and, uh, and Luke under his arms. This were written a long time after. So when the Quran speaks about the Gospel, speak about the specific revelation given to Jesus, peace be upon him. For that reason, a Muslim would have an open mind towards the Bible. And the Quran answered that question actually, especially in Surah number 5, verses 49 and 50, which says, We reveal to you, O Muhammad, this book, that is the Quran, confirming an interpretive statement, what remained intact of the revelation before it, whether it's Torah, Injil, Zabur given to David, but it says also, wa muhaymin alay, and a guardian over it. That means that the Qur'an is the criterion for the Muslim to determine and discern which was indeed the word of God, which was the interpretation of the human. A Muslim would not reject the Bible off hand, as some people might think. But he believes that the Bible contains the word of God. And as a Muslim, I cannot justify to my conscience to read the Ten Commandments, which are repeated in the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Qur'an, and say, I don't believe in the Bible. What dispute do I have with this? The Muslim would accept anything in the Bible that confirms to the Qur'an as the standard and the last well-preserved revelation. Other ideas presented by humans, thoughts that some people, as some biblical scholars said, a poetical, mythological way of expressing their feeling or reaction to Jesus, that is their opinion. There are human beings with all good intentions. They could be right or they could be wrong. Reverend Burns. I was once a Catholic, and he says, you talked about how Jesus, the so-called man, God, affected your life. 
all Christians have hard time accepting Jesus as God. How did this acceptance affect you? Didn't you question this idea? What, what was the last statement? Okay, all Christians have hard time accepting Jesus as God. How did this acceptance affect you? Didn't you question this idea? For the last 20 years, I have questioned that idea in the sense that I've taken the idea out again and again and looked at it. And one of the exciting things about doing what we're doing this evening is it's forced me to rethink this, to rethink this, this uh, uh, what I think is a very difficult question, but I think it is something at the center of what Christianity is. How has it affected me? I was raised in the uh, Episcopal tradition. Each tradition within Christianity uh, emphasizes certain things. In the Baptist tradition, for instance, a Baptist will talk about inviting Jesus into his or her life and Jesus coming into that life and becoming a part of, of my life and living with me. I don't remember as an Episcopal being confronted with that notion. Uh, somehow I grew up in Beeville, Texas. I didn't even really know that there were Baptists. There was a big church called the First Baptist Church, but I didn't really knew, know what they did in there. You know, to me, God was someone way up there, way up there, the transcendent God, the all-powerful God. And that is a part of my understanding of God now. But the notion that God is someone who comes down here, who comes across the way and speaks not from the palace, but who walks amongst us. Walking not as a king. Jesus could have come as King Agrippa. He could have come as Festus, the ruler I spoke of. But he came in the form of a, of a person who would grow up with a father who was a working man. That, to me, affected my life in the sense that it makes me think now of a God who is not just up there, but who is down here. And then a God who comes and lives in my life in a way that is as close as the skin is to my blood vessels. Um, that's how it's affected my life. To break the sequence, I'm going to ask a question to both as addressed here to Dr. Jamal Badoui and Reverend Burns. What role did Jesus play in the beginning of correction as described in Genesis? Now what role did Jesus play in the beginning of creation as described in Genesis? I read a passage from uh, uh, Paul's letter to Christians in Colossae and he has this litany of uh, that goes on and on about Jesus and who Jesus is and it speaks about Jesus being involved in creation all things were created by him and for him and through him I have great difficulty understanding what that means uh, because that gets into the whole question of the pre-existence of Christ again Christians traditionally have claimed that the, the person Jesus did not simply come to existence when he was born 2,000 years ago or so, that he had pre-existed, just as he continued to exist uh, after uh, resurrection to this very moment. Uh, I believe that he played a part. I believe that if you, again, want to look at it as a partnership, he played a part with a partnership with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Now that looks to people who are not a part of the Christian tradition, tradition as three people who are sort of all holding hands working together and that seems like polytheism and and I think that's a very important objection but I thought about that a lot there are more than there is there is more than one part to who I am I am father I am husband I am son I am teacher I am minister no. I am, uh, uh, in years past, a Cub Scout leader and Little League coach. Uh, and not only that, there are parts within me that seem to be in conflict, parts in me that seem to be in harmony. I submit that in each person there are two in one, three in one, four in one. So to me, the notion of the Trinity is not at all 
saying that that uh, God is is more than one God. There is a oneness about God, but we see Him in more than one way. And Christians have claimed that we see Him in form of Spirit, in form of Son, in form of Father. And I believe that that Son was involved in the creation of the earth. From the Islamic standpoint, Jesus Himself is a creature of His Lord Creator. He mentioned in John more than once, even after the resurrection, according to the report in the Gospel, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and I said, use the term God, my God and your God. God does not ascend to sit on the right hand of Himself. That's an obvious for the Muslim. Number two, to say that everything was created by Him and for Him is rather difficult to reconcile, because if it is created for Him, it's created by someone else. If it's created by Him, then it's not created for Him. It has to be one or the other. Thirdly, to insist on Jesus being complete man and complete God is not a mystery in my humble understanding. It is uh, a matter that uh, cannot be expressed in any intelligible terms whatsoever. Because being full God precludes that we be limited by a physical body. And being full man means it precludes anything of divinity. If I have, if I, if I have any divinity in addition to what you have, I am not a full man. My fullness as a man means man and nothing but. And to try and say that Jesus was God and man at the same time is like saying the infinite and finite are the same, the limited and unlimited are the same, the mutable and immutable are exactly the same, which is, is very difficult really to understand. Uh, when we speak about the question of the, um, the Trinity itself, uh, I am referring not to Muslim views, but views of many biblical scholars. You can check Britannica, you can check New Catholic Encyclopedia. Basically they say that the basic dilemma that has never been resolved for 2,000 years, and I doubt if it will ever be resolved, is that in defining the Trinity, the three persons are, number one, fully united, or else it becomes polytheism, as Jim said. Any emphasis on distinctiveness of the three persons in triune Godhood would have to be at the expense of their unity. And any emphasis on their absolute and perfect unity would have to be at the expense of their, of their distinctiveness, that they are doing different functions. And as such, it is simply an impossibility to reconcile. As far as other explanation that Trinity is like being father, teacher, why stop at three? Uncle, uh, grandson, a grandfather like myself, I recently became a grandfather by the way. Well, so why stop at three, number one. Number two, which is even more important. Yes, I could be father and son, but I am not the father of myself. I am a father of someone else, and I am a son of someone else. But I cannot combine the three of being the son, the father of myself. Furthermore, if I die, I cannot choose to die. No, I'm going to die as Professor Bader, but not as a father. When I'm dead, I'm dead because these are three attributes of the very same person. And maybe a point for our Christian brethren to reflect upon that the Quran also speaks about the divine attributes of God, not three, 99. So you divide by 32, you come with Trinity also. <laughs> I just joke. But when we speak about the attributes of God, that's different. You say God is merciful, God is near, God is holy, but it doesn't mean that these are persons in Godhood, these are attributes of the one and same indivisible God. We'll go on to the single questions. Dr. Jamal Badawi, on what basis do Muslims deny the cru crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, which is a known historical fact? Well, to start with, Muslims do not deny on the basis of any basic source other than the Word of God as they believe the Quran that even if it's assumed, and I'm going to question that assumption, even if it's assumed that one thing is regarded as a historical fact 2,000 years ago, God's word says something different for the Muslim, that is enough because this is the last revelation God can never err. But the assumption that the crucifixion of Jesus was an undisputable historical fact is subject to a great deal of questions. Number one, George Sales, in his introduction to the translation of the Qur'an, and he's a Christian, he used to be a very active missionary among Muslims, he cites the names of seven different Christian sects in early Christianity who believe that Jesus, in fact, was not crucified. Number two, in the 17th century, a gospel attributed to St. Barnabas, which is rejected by the church and not accepted uh, as canonical, 
also claims the same thing and indicates that when the soldiers came to, uh, to arrest Jesus, God changed the face of Judah, the Iscariot who betrayed him, and he looked like Jesus. He was taken and crucified in his place, and maybe that's why he shouted, God, God, why have you forsaken me? That's not a shout of a prophet or son of God even. Uh, and that he was crucified in his place, but Jesus was raised up unto heaven, which is very, very similar to the Muslim version of the story. Number three, the library of Najah Hammadi, which was discovered in Egypt in the 40s. And uh, Jim has referred also to the Gospel of Thomas. And by the way, uh, in a recent survey among biblical scholars in one seminary in Indiana, they say that now, to update our information, there is no divided opinion about the Gospel of Thomas. All of them say that many of the contents of the Gospel of Thomas are actually genuine and more genuine in the opinion of those scholars than many statements that are found in the four Gospels. But in any case, one of those uh, discoveries in Najah Hammadi gives a different story about the uh, Jesus peace be upon him and it says in fact he was not the one who was crucified and you find reference to that in a book written by non-Muslims in fact it's called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So to say that the crucifixion of Jesus is an established historical fact I think is not correct to start with. Number two. If we base the crucifixion of Jesus on the basis of the Old Testament prophecies, I wish I had more time like the Psalms of David where at some point he is quoted as saying, God, God, why have you forsaken me? And say, all right, that predicted what happened to Jesus. But if you carefully study that, all the Psalms that has been referred to, you will find that invariably that servant who is praying to God to save him is actually saved. Some of the Psalms of David, I will give you the chapter and verse references to that, indicate that those who are coming to take away the righteous son will be confounded and they will fall back and that God will lift his Messiah or his anointed from the gates of death and that the one who hid the net that is for Jesus as I interpret it is the one who is going to be entangled in it and the one who dug the pit is the one who is going to fall into it and these are amazing prophecies if you look at the references from Muslim and non-Muslim sources that seem to point that Judah, actually the one who dug that pit, is the one who fell into it. And invariably in those Psalms, it always say that that righteous servant would be saved. Not a bone of him would be broken. Not that he's dead. Not a bone means that God will preserve him alive, intact, and raise him up unto heaven. Secondly, even if we take the New Testament as the historical source, of the crucifixion, we will find, not we, the biblical scholars have found, and I refer you to John Fenton, to Dodds, to ja uh, George Caird, to Dennis Nineham, who pointed to the irreconcilable contradiction about the story of crucifixion. I have with me, in fact, 27 areas of complete contradiction that cannot be reconciled about the story of crucifixion. Who carried the cross? Who went to the cross? And strangely enough, there is an uh, ambivalent absence of his mother, except in John, in one place. But even in resurrection, his mother is not mentioned at all as one of the witnesses to that. And that led many biblical stories to say that the story of resurrection, which by extension could apply also to the story of crucifixion, cannot really be taken as a historical fact. Finally, some say, how are you saying that? Even though some independent observers from other than Christian sources indicate that Jesus was crucified. Dr. Paul Couchot, in his book, The Enigma Jesus, or Enigma Jesus, he said that if you examine the Greco-Roman sources, you find that according to historical scrutiny, they are undependable. And he said the only semi-credible source is the writing of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. But he said that if you really carefully look at what Josephus has attributed to have said to Jesus, it appears to be an addition or editorial work, not of the work of Josephus himself. And he gives very convincing evidence. It says, Josephus says that at that time, about the time of arising of Jesus, a good and wise man, if we can call him a man, came, number one, notice it, if we can call him a man, or if he can be called a man. Two, that he was a messiah, that he appeared in flesh after crucifixion, and that the prophets did prophesy that. According to Kushod, he said, what a Jewish historian would admit that Jesus even cannot be really fully called just a man, that he was the Messiah, that the prophets prophesied that and still not be regarded as a Jew who confessed Christianity in public. 
I think this might be very little known facts, but biblical research and discoveries are revealing more and more of that. And perhaps again, like I said, the ultimate truth, the word of God as the Muslim believe in it, does not need vindication of the human being, but it seems that the trend of research, independent objective research, will get very closer to the Quranic position. It was not Jesus who cried on the cross. Reverend Burns, how many versions of the Bible are there? And how many Bibles are identical? Bible that, that we have, and the Protestant version of the Bible claims to have 66 books, 39 in the New Test Old Testament, 27 in the New, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. If you look at that Bible, if you pick up, for instance, uh, the Bible that I brought this evening, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, it will have in certain, uh, for instance, uh, in Luke chapter 6, in one point it says, Other ancient authorities read, despairing of no man. Okay? Now, if you were to look at the verse, you'd see that there are two alternate wordings. How could that have happened? Well, how did the Bible come into being? Presumably, if you take, for instance, the gospel according to Luke. A man named Luke wrote it down. Okay? He wrote it down. No Xerox machines. You know, there, there may have been a lot of problems solved if there were Xerox machines back in those days, but there weren't. And so somebody copied down what it would become late at night. You know? And some of the scribes may have even been, you know, may have taken a little wine to help them go through the evening. <laughs> said a little wine for your stomach no one ever changed that verse that I know of so uh, so they're going along and sometimes things happen words were left out words were added lines were skipped every now and then there was a scribe who didn't like what it said didn't think it was clear enough so he would make a, an intentional change the amazing thing to me, though, is, and this, this is something, incidentally, that happens in all ancient literature, as I understand it. The amazing thing, though, is, is that as we take the Bible from these manuscripts, okay, and you put it together, and you look at the differences, most of the differences, it is obvious whether it's A or B. In the places where there are, there is no conclusion as to whether it's A or B or C, it, it, it does not seem to affect the basic belief, the basic doctrines that have been explicated by, by Christians. Um, I think that, uh, that, that it, is in, it is important, for instance, even people talk about the King James Version of the Bible, and that's really the version of the Bible. But my understanding is, is that after the King James Version of the Bible was published, that it wasn't long after that before some earlier manuscripts were discovered, that really, um, if they had been used, the King James Version would have read a little bit differently. But it would be totally misleading to think that we just have a total mishmash. It would be like I am writing a letter to someone, and it's copied by my son and my grandson and my great-grandson and my great-great-grandson, and every now and then... Uh, an article has changed, something has changed, but enough people, in fact, have copied that letter that it's so important that when you compare all the copies, it's pretty clear what the original letter said. So there's many manuscripts, and in versions, there's many, there's many modern-day translations which may have been part of the question. There's the Revised Standard Version, there's the King James Version, there's the Living Bible, which is more of a paraphrase than a translation. There's the New American Standard Version, there's the, uh, um, the Good News Bible, many, many uh, translations. And uh, one of the problems in any translation is, is it's very difficult to make a translation from one language exactly to another. And so really the different modern day translations, I think, help us to come to an understanding of what the original language was intending. Uh, just a humble thought that I thought would be useful in this kind of exchange because this is a very essential point. 
uh, Reverend Byrne has given us the uh, Booz theory of explaining some of the variations in the Bible. However, I have read some works of many uh, biblical scholars who seem to indicate that there was also another thing which was going on, and that was the deliberate evolution of the status of Jesus, peace be upon him. There have been lots of studies on that. They note, for example, that in the earliest of gospel, the gospel according to Mark, Jesus is described more really in human terms. And gradually, as time goes on, the two other Gospels, which are based on it, Luke and Matthew, seem to expand more on that theme of divinity of Jesus, but not very frankly, until you get to the latest one, the Gospel according to John, where the full-fledged uh, uh, divinity of Jesus is indicated. Uh, for example, in the volume by, edited by, by John Heck, more than one biblical scholar indicated that many things were put on the lips of Jesus, for the purpose of supporting the one controversy of the other that was going on in the early church and we can never really divorce the New Testament writing or literature from the historical cultural context in which it has risen. And there are a number of examples for this which goes more than just somebody making a mistake in copying a word. The Gospel according to John the latest and the very famous statement, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. A very common statement. You notice that the term begotten has been a foundation of some of the church doctrines when they insisted in the orthodoxy that Jesus is begotten, not made. According to the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the word begotten is not authentic and it has been dropped out. There are several biblical scholars who saw that this is not really in the most trusted manuscript. Now, one cannot say it is only by chance or because somebody was drinking booze that he added the term begotten. There seems to be a deliberate addition that meets the requirements of the ideas that existed that God begat sons, which is an idea that existed prior to uh, Christianity. Number two. When the argument was going on about the Trinity, we find something very interesting that was quoted over and over and was the closest thing in the New Testament to any statement of the Trinity. The epistle of John, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven and speaks about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, it was found that that epistle actually is not authentic and it has been dropped, even though it was one basic foundation of the Trinity. If you check the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, you would not find it there, but they split the verse number, so the number of verses is the same, but that statement does not appear anywhere. Thirdly, in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, if you check the Gospel according to Luke, in chapter 9, you find in some prints, verses 9, 16, 9 to 20, is removed from the text and relegated to, uh, to the footnote because it does not exist in the best and most trusted or most ancient uh, manuscript. And strange enough, this is the part that speaks very clearly about the resurrection of Jesus and being the, late, the earliest of the four Gospels was the basis for the two other synoptic Gospels, Luke and, and Matthew. So what I'm saying that uh, definitely uh, what uh, Jim has indicated of a possibility of human errors, yes, is, it is involved. But I'm only suggesting humbly that according to research of many biblical scholars, this seems to have been also a deliberate attempt to put words on the lips of Jesus, to add things which were not there in order to support the controversy. And that's what basically the Muslim is saying. We have nothing against Jesus at all. We never entertain the idea that Jesus was mad, bad, or God. He was neither mad, he was neither bad, but he was neither God. These are not the only three possibilities. He was a prophet of God. That's what the Muslim would say. All the dispute we have is that there is a difference between the teaching, the Christian monotheistic teaching of Jesus, which is no different from the prophets of the old, or from Prophet Muhammad for that matter, and what you might call churchianity, the Christianity as formulated by the religious institution. And I appreciated the honesty of Reverend Byrne when he said earlier that there have been many myths about Jesus, and I agree with him fully. Jesus is not a myth himself. According to the Quran, he did exist and live. But many myths have been created about Jesus because the idea of God incarnate existed before Jesus. Krishna, in, in, in Hinduism before Christianity, was believed to the incarnation of the second person of the triune godhood of Shiva. Buddha was regarded as the incarnation of God. Mithra was believed to be the son of God, born on the 25th of December, died for the sins of humanity, went to the hell for three days and ascended to heaven. 
and the, in the various cults of sun worship in the environment in which Christianity began to spread in the Middle East and other places, they believed in the sun god, S-U-N, also with the significance of the 25th of December, being born, sometimes miraculously born, atoning for the sins of humanity and arising from death alone. There are so many of these that has been going on in the world around which Christianity. So just to conclude, as the Quran itself presents itself, say, O oh people of the book, come to a common terms between you and us, that we worship none but God alone, that we associate none with Him in worship, and that we should not take from among or erect from among ourselves as humans gods besides God. If they turn back, say, bear witness, we are Muslims. That means we can still love each other, understand each other, exchange information, but live also as friends. Dr. Jamal Badawi, since that was a comment. Uh, the message of Christianity is clear and not always understood by Muslims. Dr. Jamal Badawi, what is the message of Muslim religion and what do you believe to be the message of Christianity? I think we have to make a distinction before answering that question, which Christianity are you asking me about? To me, if you mean by Christianity what Jesus taught, then Christianity is Islam. And the Quran insists that all prophets were Muslims because the word Islam actually means to willingly, consciously, lovingly and trustingly submit to God and follow His command and accept His grace. Muslims do not believe, by the way, that your salvation is by way of deeds and that by your deeds you're saved. The Prophet indicated that. It is by grace of God, but to deserve that grace you have to do something in terms of correct belief and actions. So in that sense, what Jesus taught, what Moses taught, what Muhammad or Abraham taught was Islam to teach humankind to submit to their Creator and follow His command and receive His grace and establish their direct relationship with Him. So that they can feel the presence of God, not only coming in history for a few years, but to feel the constant presence of God at all times through their pure nature, and that is called in Arabic or the Quranic terminology, taqwa, to be conscious and feeling the presence of God at all times, not just in the period where some prophet came or left. That is the essence of the teaching of all of this. But if you're saying Christianity in terms of uh, uh, churchianity or the ideas, uh, about Jesus interpreted by different institutions, then obviously these are human interpretation in our humble understanding. As far as the message of Islam, the message of Jesus, the message of Moses, it has been basically the same, to submit to God because that's the foundation of establishing relationship with other human beings and with the universe at large. And unless we're clear and unconfused, at least about some of the basic attributes, not the essence. The essence of God is a mystery, we admit, like our Christian brethren. But unless we have some intelligible terms in which we can understand the fundamental attributes of God, something that goes not only with our hearts, but with our minds, because the mind in Islam is not against the heart. Reason and faith are not enemies according to, to, to Islam. They should corroborate with each other. So this is basically the mission of Islam and what all the prophets taught in the past. Reverend Burns, as you said, Jesus has been killed. And Jesus is son of God, so where was God when they killed his son? Thank you. Calm down, guys. Traditional answer, as I, as I hear it in the Christian community, traditional orthodox answer, God the Father was in heaven feeling great pain because of the separation that was occurring as his son died on the cross. And the early Christian community considered whether or not, are you saying God the Father died on the cross? And again, that heresy was called patra passionism. The word heresy means heresy, uh, a seminary prof told me once. When you are thinking about Christianity, move right up to the edge of heresy. But be careful not to go over. What he meant by that is, if we simply walk in unthought through doctrines, then we are not opening our mind to God. We are not submitting to the will of God. We have to rethink, re-understand what these doctrines mean. So, no, God didn't die, period, in the sense that God ceased to exist 
for a moment when Jesus rose, died on the cross. You know, and then and then if when Jesus rose from the dead, God then pops up into being. God always was alive. I realize it's a very difficult doctrine. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the things that Dr. Badawi has, has been saying about quoting certain biblical scholars. Paul wrote to Christians in Corinth, love is patient, love is kind, but I think Paul would have agreed with the modern day concept of tough love. Love means speaking the truth in love, and I think Paul might have said to some of the modern day Christian scholars that uh, Dr. Badawi has has quoted, your learning, your great learning is making you mad. I could quote, you can quote scholars on either side in Christendom. You can go down south to Dallas Theological Seminary and you can bring forth men that, from there and they can come up here and they will disagree totally with some of the things that are said by the scholars quoted by Dr. Badawi. Now, does that mean that Christianity is in confusion? It means that we can never comprehend the mind of God. God's ways are not our ways. God's mind is not our mind. I agree. God is someone who, if we claim that we can completely comprehend Him, then we are claiming to be God. You know, we try to understand. Uh, the Christian community, for instance, in trying, in, you know, I don't, I, I, how can you get back to the original Jesus? Everything that we know is through other human beings that has been ministered to us through other human beings. Why do you believe that the Quran is true? Because God said so. I claim not exactly because mother or father or friend gave to you a Quran and opened it to you and began to read it and began to explain it. If you tell me that no, no Muslim teacher ever explained the word, I never thought about it. It had to come through a human mind, thinking through your own mind or following the teaching of someone like Dr. Badawi. Always we try to understand God through the teaching of imperfect human beings. So no, I don't at all throw out what the Christian community has said as if, well that doesn't count, only what counts is what happened. The only way we know what happened is through trying to rethink it as we use our own human imperfect minds. And to claim that God has spoken to us and that we have understood it perfectly because God spoke to us, we're claiming that our minds are perfect in essence, we're claiming to be God. And I don't claim to be God, you know. Okay. Dr. Jamal Badawi, in the New Testament it clearly states, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That's John 1.14. This is a clear statement of Christ's divinity. And if not taken out of context, further asserts Christ's divinity. Please comment. Well, I think I answered that question in the very early part of the presentation. Did Jesus say that? These are statements made by people long time after Jesus. They are entitled to their opinion, which are actually shaped by their own background and the philosophical argument that was going on about that time. John was not an eyewitness of Jesus in all likelihood, and many biblical scholars place the date of that Bible, uh, that gospel about the year 100. He was not an eyewitness. He was, according to some, actually, perhaps a philosopher, a student of philosophy, of new Platonic philosophy, which actually had a very similar kind of trinity in Greek philosophy. The how they made the one become many, and the contact between God and the world, and how to reconcile that through intermediary, which is the mind. Change the title, just put the sun, becomes very close to that. Furthermore, we cannot just throw away lots of biblical research that has been done based on the scriptures itself, simply and say, because these people are learning but not feeling or not becoming Christians. In fact, the writers, for example, or the authors of the book, Myth of God Incarnate, have been clergy, very famous clergy, some of them, and some are well-known theologians. In the beginning of the book they say they're writing to preserve the integrity of Christianity, that you cannot keep interpreting Christianity the same way you have done it 2,000 years ago, because it has been shaped by cultural and environmental milieu that shape this kind of ideas. 
But as far as, as far as the idea of the God becoming incarnate, I would recommend an article called The Two Roots of the Christian Myth in the book edited by Hickwood, where substantial evidence, including evidence from the Bible itself, is given to show that the idea of incarnation has come possibly also as one possible source from the Samaritan beliefs who were very influential in the early history of Christianity and they did speak in abstract terms as the knowledge and wisdom of God and again the notion of incarnation Simon, in fact, one of their people, was believed to be the incarnation of the power of God and he used to call himself the standing one this idea has preceded Christianity, it did exist before so I think it is more reasonable to say that short of Jesus claiming that the opinion of non-eyewitnesses on the basis of this idea that existed is not really binding that cannot be really taken as a proof of the divinity of Jesus at all it has nothing to do with proving that, it is an expression of opinion and biblical scholars themselves say that the, there is a big difference between the gospel according to John and the three synoptic gospels and uh, they say that this was the one really that did the full work now we cannot say that God wanted to mislead mankind that he did not declare his divinity and his nature and let people for 2000 years until now even fighting over that issue in fact the Bible says in one place God is not the issuer of confusion Jesus said I teach nothing in secret why should that matter be kept secret and say alright it evolved over time through the guidance of the Holy Spirit there is no evidence to that effect and any objective study of how the dogma is developed little by little and evolved in terms of the, the divination or the deification of Jesus it be the, the, the question becomes very uh, clear, crystal clear but of course there are those who base their understanding on faith aside from any other evidence or proof of course good for them uh, the Quran says let be no compulsion in the matter of religion we exchange, we give information but uh, of course each side, each person individually is responsible before God and he is to answer before God but let me just conclude by saying one thing that as uh, one great Christian, Thomas Emlin, once said it, and I quote him on that, this is a very interesting quotation. He says, I know that Jesus loves nothing but truth and will never be offended with anyone who stands by his words that the Father is greater than I. Reverend Burns, you said God cannot understand what you feel unless he is in your shoes. Doesn't this contradict the statement that Jesus, being God, doesn't understand what his disciples felt? I, I'm not aware that Jesus, uh, I, I need to be reminded of where it says that Jesus said that he didn't understand what his disciples felt. Um, I, what was the first part of the question again, please? Okay, you said, you said, God cannot understand what you feel unless he is in your shoes. Quote, unquote. Yeah, on, on that part, okay, go ahead. Then he says, doesn't this contradict the statement that Jesus doesn't understand what his disciples felt? Well, I think that Jesus did understand what his disciples felt, and uh, perhaps it says somewhere in the scriptures that he didn't. I, I don't know where that would be written. Uh, I, uh, I... And, and, and on the statement that I made about God knowing what it means to be man as a result of becoming man, again, that is something where Christians would divide. Christ, some Christians would say that, no, God can be in heaven and can understand perfectly what it means to be man. Uh, and, and there is an honest disagreement to that. But it... Any time you're dealing with religion, though, you're dealing with real life, what people feel, what makes people operate, and perhaps it is the case that in God becoming man, it helps me to realize that God understands what it means to live life like me, to face certain sorrows, certain temptations, certain frustrations. Uh, you know, God may say in the end day, Hey Jim, I knew all along what it was like to be you. I didn't have to become man to know that. He may say that to me. But as long as he is way up here, I can, I can say, God 
You don't know. God, because I believe God was in Christ, God can say to me, yes, I do know. And when you died on a cross for your brother or for your sister, when you have died in any way for your brother or sister, then you can say that you really know what it's like to be a man and to be a brother, to be a neighbor to your fellow man. You know, so it's, it's honest difference even amongst Christians on whether or not God had to become man to know what it feels like. It seems to me, though, that that's a possibility. It seems to me that in becoming man, that God himself, is, he certainly was experiencing something that as far as I can see, he did not experience in any other way. Uh, whether that added to his understanding, I don't know. Uh, but he certainly was experiencing something that he had never, as far as I can see, experienced before. What I'm going to do now is uh, give one more question to each scholar, and then we'll have closing comments if each one of them wants to give a closing comment, and then I'll just have another more, more announcements, and then I'll conclude our event tonight. So the last question that is directed to Dr. Jamal Bedoui. You indicated that according to the Bible, in specific passages you marked, the Trinity could not exist, yet you also pointed out that the Holy Spirit sealed several prophets. If the Spirit is not a member of the Trinity, what is it? The uh, term Spirit, as used in the Quran, has different meanings depending on the different context of it. I think the one that the brother or sister was asking is one particular definition, and that is the Holy Spirit, or honest Spirit, as the Quran called it. According to the Quran, the Holy Spirit is not a member of a triune Godhood, but rather a creature of God. It is Archangel Gabriel who brought the revelation to mankind. As far as the other usage of the term Spirit of God, I think I referred to that to in the earlier introduction of the topic. That is, God says in the Quran that he breathed into every human something of his spirit. When I was talking about Jesus being described in the Quran as a spirit from God. The way the Muslim understand that, that it doesn't mean at all that God become incarnate in my body. But this is an allegorical statement to show the love of God and the intimate relationship with mankind that God has endowed us with that divine spirit or that spirit of knowledge of God, yearning for Him, looking for Him, and that's why you find people without any religious indoctrination, they have that basic, basic religious feeling and aspiration toward the Creator. So in both senses, whether you talk about the Spirit of God as the gift of innate, pure, spiritual nature that God has given to all mankind, whether they use it or not, that's another issue, or whether you speak about the Holy Spirit, Angel Gabriel, bringing revelation, neither of which has anything to do whatsoever with the notion of a triune Godhood, which, as I indicated before, is an idea that never existed in the Old Testament, never existed among Judaic people, never existed uh, in, uh, in the words of Jesus himself, nor in the Quran. It is an idea that historians have found out that existed in philosophy and other uh, mythical uh, religions prior to uh, the advent of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. We just absorbed probably in the teaching of the church. The last question directed to Reverend Burns. Both speakers tonight are highly educated and intellectual, yet both of you misunderstood each other in choice of words. Why don't you believe also Paul and other apostles may have misunderstood each other and Jesus? Exactly. I'm trying to figure out how the first and the second part related. <laughs> Read that again, please. All right. It's getting late. It's probably in my mind. I'm sure the question is perfect. All right. Both speakers tonight are highly educated and intellectuals, yet both of you misunderstood each other in choice of words. Why don't you believe also that Paul and other apostles have, may have misunderstood each other and Jesus? Gotcha. Well, it doesn't surprise me at all that I would misunderstand uh, many of the words and things that Dr. Badawi has said. 
I've lived with my wife 17 years and I misunderstand her every day and vice versa. <laughs> A, a serious point, though, is that one of the reasons uh, I think I went into physics, it's always fascinated me to look at words and try to understand basic meanings. And I tell people in jest sometimes that I went from studying one form of atom to studying another form of atom. And uh, in, 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 in doing that, uh, it's, a, it's important to, to, to try to understand what people are saying, and that's why I, I always go to my dictionary. That's, when, I, when I was even looking to see, well, we're going to have a dialogue or a debate. A dialogue. A dialogue, according to my dictionary, means that we come together and have a conversation with a purpose of trying to come to some agreement. A debate in the, in the dictionary that sits on my desk is defined as a contest between two opponents. And I would not really be willing to be in a debate at this, you know, on this issue, but I am willing to dialogue. And it's the same thing with, with Paul. I think that from one point of view, Paul was trying to understand who Christ was. Remember, Paul claims not only to be understanding the Christ of history, Paul claims that he had a personal encounter with the living, risen Christ as he was on the road to Damascus. Now, a, a good question is, well, how do you know Paul was right in his interpretation? How do you know Paul was right in saying all those highfalutin things that I read in his letter to Christians in Colossae? Uh, the reason that I believe he is right is because, again, you know, how did the Bible come to be, the New Testament part of the Bible? There never was a time that I understood it that people put down a bunch of books and said, let's vote and see which ones will win and which ones will not win. There were books that seemed to be gathered by the Christian community, and when the stamp of approval was finally put on these books, it was clear that... It, it, it became became clear which books should be in the canon and which books shouldn't. There never was, as I understand it, in the New Testament, clear this, uh, objection over, well, we should put this book in or we should leave this book out. Uh, there have been problems since then. Martin Luther called the Epistle of James a, a book of straw. But it's still in there. Uh, Dr. Buttowy referred to some uh, folks in Indiana who think that uh, the Gospel of Thomas has a lot of things going for it. Maybe 100 years from now, 200 years from now, somehow the Gospel of Thomas will be a part of the New Testament. I doubt that it will be. And I think, I, I doubt that because the way that these books come together is by a unified agreement. And uh, there are many, many other scholars who would not want to put the Gospel of Thomas in. And so, why do we believe that Paul is not just giving an interpretation, that he didn't just misunderstand? Look at him in the same way we would look as a modern-day man who misinterprets things, because the witness of the Christian community, unified Christian community over the years, has been that in some way, through Paul, we are hearing God's Word to us. Scholars say it in different ways. My goodness, there are scholars that even claim that certain books that are supposedly written by Paul weren't written by Paul. But again, that's a disagreement within Christendom. But even those scholars that claim that those books weren't written by Paul, if you say, well, do you want to pull them out of the Bible? No. No. And why they wouldn't want to is a long story that will take more than, you know, just this meeting. In conclusion, we truly thank both speakers for sharing with us the knowledge that God has gifted them with 